Science fiction has long been a philosophical genre with some commonly recurring themes. Do we really live in a simulation? What are humans like when they have no inhibitions? And one of my personal favorites, suppose you woke up one morning and you weren't you. You had been replaced completely by a perfect duplicate, complete with all of your memories. Would it actually matter? Would the you that woke up that morning ever even notice or care that they weren't really you? Of course, the more practical question that goes along with that is why you got replaced in the first place. In 1956's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, this was the result of an alien invasion that was trying to replace all of humanity as quickly and quietly as it could before a resistance could be mounted. It reflected Cold War paranoia about brainwashing and sleeper cells, all designed to undermine Western society and replace it with something cold and emotionless. But just a few years later, Wesley Berry would produce and direct The Creation of the Humanoids, which would suggest a completely different purpose. What if humanity was being replaced not to destroy it, but to preserve it? Born in 1907 in Los Angeles, California, USA, Wesley Berry was a freckle-faced kid in an era when movie stars had to look perfect. At the time, it was standard practice for actors on camera to cover any and all skin blemishes with grease paint to help create the illusion of a perfect complexion on the screen. And as a young child actor, Berry went through a lot of makeup that way. It wasn't until Marshall Nealon decided that his freckles would make him perfect for a small role in 1917's Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm that his natural complexion would appear on the screen, and his freckles almost immediately became his calling card. He had a brief but prolific acting career, playing young kids in roles in School Days, Daddy Long Legs, and Cecil B. DeMille's Male and Female, but his acting career ended when his adulthood began, which was just a few years into the advent of sound films. He would appear on screen for the last time in 1943 in the movie Ladies' Day at the age of 36, but the end of Barry's acting career didn't mean the end of his entertainment career. He transitioned swiftly into behind-the-scenes work, directing and producing television and low-budget B-movies, opened his own studio named Genie Productions, and would work pretty much non-stop until retiring in 1972. He passed away in 1994 at the age of 86. We draw off everything that makes a man peculiar to himself. His learning, his memory, these interreacting constitute his personality, his philosophy, capability and attitude. The human brain is merely the vault in which the man is stored. Barry's 1962 film The Rise of the Humanoids is sometimes inaccurately considered an unauthorized or uncredited adaptation of the Dean of Science Fiction Jack Williamson's series of Humanoids books starting with 1947's With Folded Hands. In fact, it happens so often that the IMDb's entry on the film currently includes Williamson's name in the writing credits, noting that he is uncredited as the author of the original novel. But the creation of the humanoids has little in common with Williamson's works, aside from the use of the word humanoid and the base idea of a robot serving class. By that standard, The Jetsons is actually an adaptation of Williamson's work. Beyond that, the two works share no characters, settings, plot points, or even thematic content. Rather, the creation of the humanoids was the brainchild of writer Jay Sims, who wrote mostly television screenplays for westerns and spy dramas, including ten episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel and six episodes of The Big Valley also two episodes of Here Come the Brides. But aside from his television work, Sim's name appears as the writer on a couple of Mystery Science Theater 3000 fan favorites, The Giant Gila Monster and The Killer Shrews. 
The same year that The Creation of the Humanoids was released, Sims would also pen the script for Ray Milan's Panic in the Year Zero, and his final fictional film credit would be as the screenwriter for The Resurrection of Zachary Wheeler, although he would also write the documentary Chesty, a tribute to a legend, which was not a documentary about Doris Wishman collaborator Chesty Morgan, but rather a John Ford-directed look at the life of General Lewis Burwell Chesty Puller, the most decorated Marine in American military history. Hi, yes. Hello, Maxine. Come in. Max, you're wonderful. He's so glib, I'll bet he even has a sense of humor. He'd better have. I paid extra for it. Say something funny, Pax. Don't put me on, dear. I have a sense of humor, but I'm not creative. While the creation of the humanoids was a low-budget feature even for its time, the production shows just how good Wesley Berry was at getting the most bang for his buck. The team is full of legends, including two-time Oscar-winning cinematographer Hal Moore, who had won plaudits for his work on 1935's A Midsummer Night's Dream and 1943's The Phantom of the Opera for Universal. Then there was former Universal master makeup artist Jack Pierce, who had previously designed the makeup for both Frankenstein's monster and his bride. While Barry may not have been able to convince any of the actors playing the movie's androids to shave their heads, for what was destined to be a low-budget B-movie release, he was able to convince them to sit in the makeup chair for hours on end while Pierce's design was applied, calling for the actor's hair to be slicked down with Vaseline and coated with latex bald caps, their eyebrows to be similarly greased then covered with liquid latex, wax to be spackled into the gaps between the bald cap and the edges of the latex patches, and a thick layer of blue-gray grease paint to be spread over every inch of their exposed skin before, for certain scenes, the final touch was added, hard plastic scleral contact lenses that would turn their eyes into silvery, mirrored surfaces. It was a brand new technical innovation that had only been seen on screen once before in 1957's The Brain from Planet Arouse and the lenses were provided to the production by Dr. Louis M. Zabner, who had pioneered the use of the lenses to change the color of actors' eyes on camera. All of this combines into a movie that Andy Warhol once called his favorite film, although Andy Warhol admittedly said a lot of things that were just intended to keep reporters on their toes. While Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a pretty clear piece of Cold War paranoia, the creation of the humanoids is completely blatant on its full-on assault on the concept it feels is truly destroying humanity from within, white supremacy. The film tells the story of a future society ravaged by nuclear war, where humanity has managed to cling to something approximating latter 1950s prosperity by employing the blue-gray androids that are now nearly as common as human beings themselves. They are the foundation the society stands upon, and yet violent and vocal pockets of humanity oppose granting them even the most basic of rights and recognition. These regressive sociopolitical elements have banded together into a society called the Order of Flesh and Blood, that sends out patrols to terrorize humanoids in the streets, stopping them and demanding to know what reason they have for being in the human area of town, all while wearing a uniform that looks strikingly like a Confederate soldier's right down to the cap. They're the KKK. They're straight up the KKK. There's not even an attempt to hide it. They even employ a racist slur against the androids that is based on the idea that machines make clicking sounds, but which is tossed around so carelessly that at times it sounds exactly like they just used a real-world racist slur. What are you clickers doing out tonight? We're on free time. We're not obligated to answer. As the member of the Surveillance Committee of the Order of Flesh and Blood, I demand an answer. We're going to the temple to be recharged. I think I'll keep you here till your power runs out. How'd you like that? As the movie opens, the Order is planning and executing major attacks on the robot population because they've heard rumors that the robots and their human friend Dr. Raven 
have developed a way to upgrade themselves to appear almost perfectly human. The movie follows Captain Kenneth Kragus, who is called THE Kragus by his friends and family, as though he was a monster that the kids from Stranger Things are really excited to get into in their next session of Dungeons & Dragons. Played by perennial TV Western guest star Don Megawen, the Kragus is a particularly vehement member of the Order, who harasses and abuses humanoids and, off-screen mostly, engages in terrorist acts with his fellow Order members designed to destroy as many robots as possible. His well-meaning, moderate, liberal friends click their tongues at him and tell him he shouldn't be so mean, but by now, this is pretty much his identity. Like, we never really see him taking an interest in anything else except hating one specific group of people and constantly reminding them that he doesn't feel like they deserve any rights. In fact, it makes for a very bitter, angry exchange between him and his own sister when she announces her intention to marry her previous humanoid servant, Pax. When the Kragus meets Maxine Megan, he is immediately enchanted by the pretty blonde moderate who seems so willing to listen to all of his political blustering, even though she expresses a distaste for the order of flesh and blood. Their romance blossoms quickly, just in time for the big twist ending of the movie to be revealed. The Kragus and Maxine are not nearly as human as they believe themselves to be. They are, in fact, androids themselves. Their bodies and faces were carefully crafted in the exact image of humans who had recently died. And then the memories, personalities, and beliefs of those humans were grafted into them. But they are capable of being programmed by higher-ups among the humanoids to take subtle action to sabotage the Order and other anti-humanoid movements, even without their own knowledge. But what at first seems like a sinister plot is in fact intended to preserve humanity, not destroy it. The humanoids have been working together with Dr. Raven to improve not just their physical resemblance to humanity, but also their mental and emotional resemblance, and to perfect the process of transferring human consciousness into robot bodies. The secrecy in which this was conducted was not just to protect the humanoids, but to protect the human transplants themselves, as the shock of discovering that they have been resurrected as robots is often hard enough to cause them to re-die. But Dr. Raven, now reincarnated himself in a spiffy younger robot body, decides it's time to drop the charade, and at his urging, the humanoids finally inform the Kragus and Maxine of their status. And as they come to terms with their new identities, Raven gives them one more shock. He's ready to try an upgrade on the two of them that he has been working on in secret. The final upgrade that would allow them to be completely indistinguishable from humans themselves. An upgrade that would allow them to reproduce. Hello, boys. Have a good night's rest. I missed you. You might at this point see where this movie is going, and sure enough, the fourth wall is broken in the final moments to explain that this is a creation myth. What you have just seen is not humanity's future, but its past. And we, watching the movie, are the product of the humanoids' plans, a reborn and preserved human race. It is not a perfect metaphor. It's a little bit clunky, if well-meaning, but mistakes were definitely made. However, it serves as a fascinating counterpoint to Invasion of the Body Snatchers, painting the idea of an invasion of the human race as being a possibility for real growth and change, instead of being inherently evil, and suggesting that those who are particularly bound to the past, to the point of condoning and even executing violence and terrorism, as we are told the Kragus has, are not the heroes bravely standing against a frightening new world, but the scared final remnants of the bad old days, whose holding out could actually doom humanity in the long run. The Ministry of Information doesn't want it known that robots are dealing in robots, but only give the flesh and blooders something more to yell about. They're a minority. A loud minority. 
So why is the creation of the humanoid so rarely thought of while Invasion of the Body Snatchers has been remade no less than three times, even more if you count the completely unofficial remakes like the Asylum's 2007 mockbuster Invasion of the Pod People or the eerily adjacent stories like Robert A. Heinlein's The Puppet Masters or Stephanie Meyer's The Host? Could I really be suggesting that the Cold War was so coldly politically manipulative that a special effort was made to hype one of these movies as a classic because it fit the preferred narrative while the other was buried because it was inconveniently promoting the brotherhood of all mankind? Yes, I'm saying exactly that. No, I'm just suggesting it's unfortunate fallout of the cultural hegemony at the time that people in the West gravitated toward the more repressive story than toward the one that urged peace and cooperation. I'm saying it's not really that simple. A lot of factors play into where a movie falls on the spectrum between cult classic and just plain mainstream accepted classic. Not just who picks up the movie, but issues of money, distribution, and publicity. And the creation of the humanoids had a lot going against it. First of all, while both movies are pretty talky, Body Snatchers is talky in a familiar Hollywood way, where heroes sit down in a living room or a garden seating area and talk things out. It's not high adventure, but it's realistic. Humanoids, on the other hand, is talky in the manner of a Brechtian stage play, where the point of the talking isn't to draw you into a realistic world, but to deliver a didactic message. And the resemblance to a stage play is made all the more obvious by the set design that seems unconcerned with whether you realize this entire movie was filmed on a soundstage or not. It even uses flats and black curtains in the background. All it really needs to complete the image of a live stage show is a proscenium arch and an orchestra pit. Then there's the fact that Body Snatchers was produced by Allied Artist Pictures, a former Poverty Row producer that was seeking to claw its way out of the gutter through superior production values, while Humanoids was produced by Genie Pictures, a company that relied on low budgets and the low-end B-movie market for its business plan to work, and concentrated all of its distribution efforts on small, independent theaters, and drive-in movies. Invasion of the Body Snatchers provoked conversation among critics and commentators that fed into free publicity for the movie, while the creation of the humanoids was largely ignored by the media and ultimately wound up finding its cult audience in late, late show airings on television. And there's the fact that Allied Artists, when it finally went out of business, had produced such an astounding body of work that it was snapped up by none other than Warner Brothers, who pushed Allied Artists' classics as hard as they did their own, while Genie Pictures never really caught the eye of any of the majors. Ultimately, Humanoids just didn't have the machine behind it that Body Snatchers did. But it is well deserving of a modern revisit, and as recently as 2021, it is still being screened by late-night sci-fi and horror hosts, like the revived Sven Gulli on MeTV. I don't know what it's like to have to cover skin blemishes with makeup so that you appear to have a good complexion on camera at all. Why would you say that? The creation of the humanoids was an interesting bookend as the final role of actor Dudley Manlove, who played the role of Lagan and who, in addition to just having a fun name to say, had begun his film acting career playing Eros in 1957's Plan 9 from Outer Space, produced, written, and directed by Ed Wood. The B-movie world is a small world after all. Thanks for checking out the video, folks. As always, you can find relevant links in the description below. If you've watched this far, leave a comment with our new secret code word in it. Let's make that code word, uh, I don't know, Great Caesar's Ghost. That sounds like a great code word to me. Great Caesar's Ghost. Until next time, watch like it means something. Can we take another look at that poster for school days? Yeah, that's Wesley Berry, but check out the bottom of the poster. P.S. Marshall Nealon loaned me to Warner Brothers to make this picture. That, that sounds healthy.